Welcome to our long-awaited webinar on retained primitive reflexes and I'm really excited to share this stuff with you today and I hope that you're excited to learn more about these things that wreak havoc in our life and I trust by the end of this webinar you're just going to have a better understanding of what their purpose is as well as how to spot them in your own children, in yourselves and perhaps even in the children that you're working with. So before we begin, just a disclaimer, um, I'm going to read it out because many of us do this passive watching because we're really interested, but yes, we mom or wife and we have to be available to the family as well. And so let me read it out in case you're doing that. So no medical diagnosis, prognosis or treatment will be and can be made due to the information shared in this webinar. The purpose of this webinar is to introduce you to the power of movement and learning. If you enjoyed this webinar, you're welcome to contact us to find out more about courses that train you in these specific moves. It is important to remember that every person is unique and what works for one person may not necessarily work as well for another. By continuing, you consent to the fact that you understand and agree with the above. So let me just introduce myself. If you don't know me, my name is Kerry Ann Gordon and I run Mindful Moves. I'm an educational kinesiologist, an advanced movement facilitator, a teacher having studied ECD and foundation phase as well as FET, and I'm currently studying neurofeedback through Brain Trainer U in America. Um, so what does all this mean? Well, educational to educate means to draw out, and I'm all about the drawing out of potential in all the people that I'm working with. And kinesiology is the study of movement, the study of our muscles and the way in which we respond in this world. Um, we use, obviously, as an advanced movement facilitator, I use movement and I facilitate learning and growing and developing as a person through this. And of course, this all started off with this love of teaching and this love for people, wanting to see people in my life reach their full potential. So with this webinar, if you please at the end fill in an evaluation form, you will receive a checklist, an observational checklist that I've put together. And what this does is it gives you some questions to ask. And of course, this is, as I say, free with the evaluation form. And as you answer these questions within this checklist, you can start seeing for yourself, does this person that I'm looking at have retained primitive reflexes? And will they benefit from a movement program? Kane Ramsey was a man that I did a life coaching course with, and he has this brilliant saying. So we all know the saying, if you teach a man to fish, he will never go hungry. But Kane takes it one step further and he says, if you teach people to teach people to fish, that's when you solve world hunger. And of course, this is my little give back, hopefully, to the teachers and the parents out there who are feeling frustrated and overwhelmed. So just a little bit of my story. I had studied to be a high school teacher. I then had my own two children, um, my daughter being neurotypical and my son being atypical. Um, and of course, it didn't matter that I had these two teaching qualifications behind me, one for high school, one for ECD and foundation phase. I had the certificates. I had the marks and yet with my son, I could see the potential and I just didn't know how to draw it out. And I wasn't going to let this opportunity pass me by that I couldn't have my son reach his full potential in this world. And so I myself started looking into extra courses and it was here through these courses that I found the missing link. And so having found this information, I want to give it to other people. You know, I think so many people um, don't really know my <laughs> what drives me. And what drives me is to help other people. I can remember feeling helpless and frustrated and overwhelmed and like I was in a dark hole and I just needed somebody to give me that next information that was just going to get me through whatever I needed to do at that moment. And so this is why I share this with you. These short introductory courses are for free, as I say. Some of them will just take you through the introduction to that course, and then you can decide if this is something that you want to invest your time and your money in doing. 
Um, but others, like the concentration course, I've really gone out my way. It's a little bit longer, so the introduction to the solutions to impaired concentration one, which is, is which I'm speaking about now, um, I've put in extra stuff. My hope is that even if you just watch these introductory courses, you're going to leave with some tools to take and try. And this kind of work sells itself because if you take something and you can see it can work for you and you can see you have results immediately in the fact that your child can relax more, can focus more, can um, participate better, you know, you're going to obviously want to learn how to do it yourself and have an experience that on a daily basis. And so, you know, I leave, I leave this here for you to go have a look at. I give it to you. My hope is that I will be adding more introductory courses so that you can go have a look and see what is it that's going to best suit you and the situation that you find yourself in. In our work, we know that a goal is the most important thing to start with. Without a goal, I'm running around like a chicken without a head. I could be running away from all the things I don't want, but not necessarily in any direction. I could possibly be running in circles, spending energy, wasting my time, feeling exhausted, feeling overwhelmed, feeling drained. And yet when I stop and take a look, I'm in exactly the same place where I started. And so a goal directs us. It allows us to consider what our intentions are. And even if we just know which direction we are moving in, you know, as we take those steps, we can readjust and refine that what it is that we're doing so that we can really end up somewhere where we want to be. And so I always say it's like, you know, if a person wants to go to Durban, having the goal is knowing you want to go to Durban. Um, and then, of course, you can get the map and you can plan for that, that journey towards your destination. If you don't even know where you want to go and you get in the car and you just keep driving around, well, you're going to use up petrol, you're going to put mileage on your car. And guess what? When you get to wherever you decide this is the point to finish, you pro most probably are not going to be at the seaside where you can take your shoes off and relax and just enjoy. And so what are your goals for this webinar? What are your goals in life? Um, I've got some big ones here. So to make a difference, to be better equipped, to invest in myself to have that next step in mind and to educate others. And of course, in that, where, where, where am I going to make this difference? Is it in my life? Is it in my home? Is it in my classroom? Is it in my office space with my colleagues? Yes, this type of stuff can definitely be taken into the office space as we work with people. What do I want to be better equipped for doing? To know what to look for in people when they're having these issues? Is it really their fault or is it something that can be helped? to understand what behaviors and actions mean, to find out how small change can make a big difference, very important one, to invest in myself, to, to actually learn through this webinar something new, to add to my toolbox, okay, so to learn something that will benefit even the people around me, to become excited about life and learning and, you know, growing in a new way. And maybe even it's just to have this hour where you're doing something for yourself and not for somebody else. That next step in mind, to have clarity, as I was speaking about earlier on, I just needed clarity. I just needed to know where to put that next foot um, and then just trust that that next space would be revealed as I took that step. To be empowered. So just to know that I have the ability to make a difference. You know, so often we as parents and teachers, we pass, we, we give our power away. The minute we have a child that we, we find we're battling with in class, we send off the parent to somebody else. We send off ourselves or we start looking for other people. And we don't realize, especially when it comes to retained primitive reflexes, that we have the power to help these children. And we're knowing that we have the power to help and to work and, and to do something in these children's life. It also allows us to understand when it is beyond us. So when I need to ask somebody for help and in needing to ask somebody for help, if I have this clarity, I will know who to ask for help. I will also understand that there is not just one direction. There are many options available, many non-invasive options available that have very little side effects. 
And of course, when we're talking about our loved ones, you know, we do want what's best for them. And so, yes, to know there is another way. Our story, we can share our story with others. We can educate others with other options that are available that we came across. And we can afford other people the right to decide for themselves. You know, this is something I really do not enjoy that seems to happen over and over again, is so often we are dictated to and told what we should do by other people who don't know themselves that there are options available. And in this, we are able then to respect others and honor each person as being unique. I don't want to waste your time, so let's just check. Working with reflexes, is it for you or is it not for you? Okay, and so I just want to, and we're going to get into all of this, but we are working with the body naturally, the way it's meant to develop. When we work with reflexes, we're going right back to things that should have happened in utero, things that should have happened in that first year of life. And if you understood or understand that this would have taken, what, a year and nine months, to really fall into place and we're trying to do it in the space of a few months well then we can appreciate this process what it isn't while we build the body up better is it's not a quick fix so if you want a quick fix and you're not willing to really change the cause of what you're seeing this is not for you okay if you're not prepared to put in a few minutes of work every other day with your child using movement programs then this is not for you and lastly, if you are of the belief that the body cannot heal itself and that it needs human interference, um, then again, I don't think that this would be the type of work that you'd be interested in. Okay, let's have some fun, or rather, let's stress you out. Okay, picture the scene. Okay, you're sitting here. I hope it's nice and big in front of you. You know the scene. It's raining, it's storming, it stormed here yesterday, oh, it was a nightmare, that kind of storm, buckets coming down that you can't see in front of you. Um, it's five o'clock, which it was yesterday, okay, five o'clock and you're stuck in traffic. Not only that, you've got the radio on, you had it on before, you always have it on, but you've also got kids now in the back who are talking louder than the rain and screaming over there. Okay, and all this while you are trying to see through this windscreen in front of you and focus on the traffic. You've got taxis pulling in, you've got people slamming on brakes and people can't drive when it rains. Um, I want you to take yourself there and just ask yourself, are you able in that moment, if I had to give you a sum or ask you an intricate like, question, would you be able to perform at your peak? And yet this type of stuff, is happening to our children in classroom all the time. So just take a few seconds to be in that space and just consider how are you responding in that moment? Are you stressed out? What does that stress do? What kind of sensations do you have in your body? For me, I find that I'm clinging onto that windscreen, uh, onto the, the steering wheel. My body is right forwards, looking as far as I can as I squint my eyes to try and see through that window, uh, windscreen while that wiper is moving so fast and I think it's actually giving me more <laughs> a heart attack than helping uh, because of course it's moving so intensely in front of my face um, and we all know this is when we start screaming at kids shut up stop fighting um, we turn the radio off don't we because we need to see we tell them to keep quiet because we can't see what are we doing have you ever noticed that why is it when this is taking place, we tell our children to keep quiet so that we can see? The truth is, our senses are just being so overloaded by what's happening and the stress in the situation. So we just need one of those senses to calm down so that we can compensate or work through the others. And so when we ask our children to stop fighting, please be quiet, when we turn the radio off so that we can see better, we can understand that we ourselves are trying to calm down a lot of the sensory input coming in so that we can actually focus and function better. Okay, don't cheat, don't look for the numbers yet. So we're going to just extend that exercise to this little one that I have in front of you because obviously it's one thing when we're in the car and we can potentially have an accident. Um, so we are, you know, very fearful of that. 
But the brain doesn't know the difference when we're stressed between, you know, the life-threatening thing that is that can happen or just a test that's sitting in front of me. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do a bit of a dot-to-dot -dot here. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. And while you are in, so you have 30 seconds, you've got to try find numbers 1 to 40. You can't obviously draw on your screen, I'm guessing. So you'll be tracing with your finger from number 1 in the proper order, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 40. And we're going to see if you're able to do this. In 30 seconds so go and what we're going to see you're going to see when we do this I just get so stressed out um, I like to obviously look for these things and, I, and and when I'm stressed like this what really happens is I don't actually see the numbers my eye because of the way in which my brain organizes itself looks with the other eye and then I start seeing it in reverse so instead of like 25 I start seeing 52 and instead of like 15 I see 51 instead of like 32 I see like 23 and it just throws my mind and just like that your 30 seconds are up put your pen down where did you get so yes, I was talking the whole time. This is what happens in real life, is we don't have this vacuum that we go into when we do these tests. We even used to have a teacher who would do exactly that, and she would actually be telling us instructions um, while we were busy writing the test. And so while we were trying to concentrate, we also not only had the clicking pen, we didn't only have um, the scraping of the chairs, but we also had some important, some not so important uh, instructions being called out while we were trying to read and write. And so when we go into this place where we're really, really stressed, we cannot think properly. So just I want you to consider, um, even if you have to take yourself back to school and think about how you felt in tests and how you felt today, what was your thinking like? Were you able to think clearly? Were you like me that you weren't able to see numbers? Um, was your thoughts rambled? Could you find them quickly? Um, how did you feel? Any sensations in your body? A tight chest, a racing heart, sweaty palms? And, and what was your emotions? Were you happy and excited to do this? Or was it something that made you feel quite nervous? So if you haven't done so yet, maybe you want to just grab yourself a piece of paper and just jot down um, some of the feelings that you had. Um, yeah, your experience, your experience in the rain, in the car. Um, just thinking about, again, those three things, my thoughts, my emotions and my sensations. And then as you think about all of that, you know, ask yourself, well, how well are you doing in that state? How reactive are you? Um, are you able to really think through what is busy taking place? And this is the problem. When we're on high alert, you know, it's like um, I'm doing this brain trainer course. It's so interesting. And, and the man explains that it's like having a business. And in this business, you've got security guards. And in this business, you've got maintenance. And maintenance needs to clean out the trash and change light bulbs and fix things that are broken. But when we are in danger or if, if the environment becomes more dangerous, we've got to let go some of the maintenance crew and employ more guards. And so as we do this, you know, yes, we are more ready to take on whatever's coming our way, but we are not doing so well inside because floors aren't getting cleaned, light bulbs aren't getting changed. And this is what happens when we stay in stress or in this in this place where we feel like we're in danger for long periods of time. We don't have this balance that we need for good health. So primitive reflexes, what are these? Well, let's have a look what they contribute to first. And there is a very long list here, and I'd like to go through it with you so that you understand why it is that Kerry Ann Gordon from Mindful Moves goes on and on and on about these primitive reflexes. And so they contribute to labels such as ADD, ADHD. Yes, we call it ADD, ADHD at Mindful Moves for a very specific reason. Okay, autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, or dysgraphia, speech problems, aggressiveness, allergies, anger, anxiety, asthma, Attention issues, auditory processing issues, ears, nose and throat infections, eczema, hand-eye coordination, fear of failure, fear of phobias, fidgeting behaviour, fine motor skill issues, food intolerances, 
making it difficult to make friends, memory issues both in long-term memory and short-term memory issues, messy eating, mood swings, mutism, pincer grip, so now we're talking about the, the way we hold our pencils, um, poor dexterity, poor posture, poor self-esteem, poor stamina, balance problems, bedwetting, problems with boundaries, you know, the setting and understanding of them, breathing difficulties, clumsiness, colitis, concentration issues, this need to control, so this need to dominate and manipulate, coordination issues between the upper and lower body, problems copying off the board, issues with crawling, and this includes children who have crawled, but they've crawled for too short of a time, or some who've even skipped it completely. And so we see also children who have issues, they've, they have these delays in crawling and that as well. Children who, or people who have problems with criticism, frustration, handwriting difficulties, head control issues, homolateral movement, hyperactivity, hypersensitivity, hypertonic muscles, hypochondria. So you know when your mother wants to take you off to the doctor for being a hypochondriac, well, maybe it's a primitive reflex. Um, low immune system, uh, and so yes, you just get sick all the time. Lack of empathy, a limited diet, low self-esteem, procrastination, reading problems, restless sleep, sequencing and timekeeping difficulties, sleep difficult and difficulties, and these are all of them from nightmares to night terrors to sleepwalking to um, not falling asleep to not falling asleep and going through all the cycles. Um, spatial awareness difficulties, stiff neck, so problems with the stiff neck, children who are tactile defensive, thumb or finger sucking, and that goes to anything that goes in the mouth, so chewing off pencils, chewing off clothes, toe walking, vision challenges, W sitting, and also wriggling, these children who can't sit still, they continue to wriggle in their seat. We're going to be looking at just some forerunners, pioneers in this work to better understand what these reflexes, these primitive reflexes are about. And the first person we look at is Sally Doggard Blythe. This is a quote out of a book from The Well-Balanced Child, Movement and Early Learning. I buy my books from exclusive books online. I've never had a problem. And this, of course, was one of them. If you want, you can ask them to deliver it to the shop. And then whenever I'm ready, I can go past and pick it up. So, yeah. Definitely an easy book to get hold of in South Africa. The quote that we look at, the process of motor development in the first year of life is described through a series of reflexes, which provide mirrors on the child's developing nervous system while providing an inbuilt training program for motor skills. So important. So what is she saying? These particular reflexes, referred to as primitive reflexes, they give us an understanding of how well this child's nervous system is developing. So if they are there when they're not meant to be there, that is a red flag. But while we're able to observe these and understand how this child is developing, they are also um, being used by the body to help the body develop so that it can take over from these primitive reflexes and then, of course, move more uh, voluntarily and with coordination. Another one of my absolutely favorite at the moment is this Dr. Robert Malelo. Um, there's plenty of things you can watch on him on YouTube. You can like his Facebook page and find out more there. But I have gotten a whole lot of information from his book called Disconnected Kids. I bought it on Loot. This one you can't get on exclusive books. And his books you have to really just watch and grab because um, yeah, once, they're, once they're available, they're gone. Um, and so let's take a look at what, at what he says. Problems performing primitive, ref, primitive motor reflexes, such as difficulty in suckling or the inability to feed at the breast, are also signs of improper brain development. If a baby is delayed in acquiring a motor mice, milestone, so these are the, the developmental milestones, it is most likely because her or his primitive reflexes are still active. So again, very important to understand how looking at these give us an indication as to whether or not this brain is developing as it should. 
And of course, because this is such a delicate process, as he goes on to explain his, in his book, when one of these things are a little bit out or a little bit delayed, it starts impacting on the brain development or the development of the, neuros, the, the nervous system of which the brain is a part. Okay, extremely exciting. So this comes from um, Rhythmic Movement Training Course. And in South Africa, we've got a lady, Sonia Hawkins, who is qualified to train level one and level two of this international course. And so in this book, we get from um, Moira Dempsey the following quote, okay? And this, of course, is from Rhythmic Movement Training One, Focus, Organization and Compre Comprehension. If we did not have primitive reflexes, we would have no way to develop the ability to become upright and eventually gain control of voluntary movement. Most of these are meant to be integrated or inhibited by six months. However, for some reason, they are still active after this time then they act as a barrier to learning, sensory processing, and emotional maturity. Very important again. So we've seen from these three, of course, it's a mirror to the nervous system, um, seeing delays in the developmental milestones, which we've all been given somewhere by probably the nurse that we visited, okay, shows that there's an imbalance in the brain. And these are very important their role being to help us get to a point where we can stand upright and that we can move voluntarily through this world. Let's continue to learn from these experts. So big head, small space. Dr. Robert Malilo explains that the brain is the only organ that is not fully developed at birth. When the fetus is born, its head needs to pass through a narrow birth canal. It appears that the genes responsible for growing brain cells wait for the signal that the baby is outside the mother's body before continuing to their development. These genes, called experience-dependent genes, are influenced by environmental factors like light, sound, movement, gravity, temperature and touch. Movement is crucial for the brain to grow as it triggers the activation of our senses. However, our frontal lobe and motor cortex are not developed enough to uh, initiate this movement. This is where the primitive movement, uh, primitive reflexes come into play. And so this baby needs to move, but the brain isn't developed enough yet to move, not voluntarily, voluntarily. And so these primitive reflexes are automatic movements, spontaneous moves that are going to allow this baby to start responding to the environment. And of course, so, this whole um, thing starts developing. Let's take a look at the different types of reflexes that we have. And so we're going to be looking at the brainstem for the primitive reflexes. But as we read further on, we're going to notice that the postural reflexes um, don't come from the brainstem. They come from the midbrain. OK, um, these are the reflexes, as I say, where the guy knocks my knee and my leg shoots out. OK. I want certain reflexes there to keep me up straight, but I don't want these primitive reflexes there as I get older that are coming from the brainstem. So let's just read. We know that the brainstem, what does he do? It helps control breathing, heart rate, and these primitive reflexes. So these reflexes are automatic actions performed by the body in reaction to a stimulus. The brainstem is responsible for primitive reflexes and which should be fully developed at birth and then gradually integrated into the mind-body system. As the frontal lobes develop, these reflexes are suppressed to allow for normal development in children. On the other hand, postural reflexes, so they come in afterwards, we're going to see, they originate from the midbrain and they help maintain a child's upright posture. These reflexes emerge after birth. So, of course, our primitive reflexes emerge even during utero, but our postural reflexes will emerge after birth and they should be fully developed by the age of three and a half. So what do we as teachers and parents do? So the first thing that we do is we look and we say, oh, there's a problem reading, there's a problem writing, there's a problem with their math skills, they're swapping letters, they're skipping lines, their eyes are jumping, their handwriting's untidy, they can't do cursive. Um, they don't know how to form letters properly. Um, they don't know how to do math skills. Uh, so what do we do? We go and buy a million books for them to read a week. 
we go and buy these very inappropriate, some of them activity books at these stationery shops that teach all the wrong letters, often put together by people who don't understand, uh, understand teaching inappropriate skills. And of course, then they've got their little rubby pen and they A for away. Um, but these things don't seem to help, do they? Um, and then, of course, we're making them do maths till it comes out their ears. Sometimes we realize that this might be a deeper problem and that it might be an issue with stuff called your auditory processing skills or your visual processing skills. And so we realize, well, this child doesn't understand patterns or isn't comprehending what they're hearing or doesn't remember what they've read uh, or what they've heard. They can't break apart the sounds that they're hearing. Sometimes we realize they can't remember what they see or they can't put it in the right order or they also can't look up to the board and down again. And so we realize that these movement patterns have problems. We might even go as far as to start drilling them in terms of fine motor and gross motor, spatial awareness, hand-eye coordination. We get them moving in cross-lateral ways. We get them moving in homolateral ways. We get them moving in homoglobus ways. We might even realize that the problems are the senses themselves. And then off we go to check out the eyes. Some of these little poor children get these glasses. They end up at um, ophthalmologists. Some children end up with grommets and getting their ears checked, realizing that there might even be fluid in their ears. Um, touch, taste and smell. Well, we only pick up that when the kid is either crashing and smashing into stuff or smelling and tasting everything or avoiding smells and tastes. We, we know that there's something, of course, they keep falling over. These children are clumsy. Um, but, and we've heard these words, proprioception and vestibular, but what do they mean? We don't really quite know. The truth is now we're really getting to where these causes lie. And so while we need these long-term life, uh, lifelong uh, postural reflexes and we need the foundations in the nervous system, the very true part, the very uh, important part of this building is in actual fact our retained primitive reflexes. And all these things are built onto this as such. And if these are uh, still there, their indications, again, as we said, that this nervous system is not doing what it's meant to do, and of course can hold and prevent other reflexes falling in place. These are going to affect everything that we look as we see going up into this tower. And so this is a problem when we're fixing the roof, but not the foundation. So this is what we end up doing. We end up, yes, fixing the roof, dealing with what we're seeing when we don't realize that all these issues are actually coming from something deeper. And so when we don't understand how retained reflexes and brain imbalances work, we are fixing the roof, but never the problem. OK, in my line of work, yes, as a teacher and with what I do, I will often have teachers and parents say to me, but they can do it. They can write their name. They've learned to read. They can concentrate for so long. And what we don't understand when we're missing these important bricks in our tower is that this building is compensating and it's compensated. <laughs> so this child is having to mentally, with lots of effort, concentrate on what it is that they're doing. So writing never becomes something smooth and easy. I'm always straining while I'm overriding these hand reflexes, these postural reflexes in order to sit up straight and to do the work. And so with lots of effort, I'm able to write. And for grades one, two and three, these children might be doing OK. They are working slower at a slower pace. The workload isn't as much being fewer learning areas. But often these children, the wheels come off for them in grade four, because not only with all of this, they've also just learned cursive, which they're now expected to write with. They now also sitting in lessons of probably half an hour to 45 minutes. So there's a time constraint. The teacher's pressurized. So the teacher's stressed. Um, there's work that has to, has to be jotted down quickly from the board while the teacher's calling out um, instructions. It's a far more stressful environment. And the problem with these reflexes is, yes, when I feel in danger and I feel um, that I'm, I'm stressed, I'm going to see them a bit more. I'm going to have a, le a shorter fuse. And so just going back to you being in that car and having to drive with all this coming at you. Yes, you can drive the car. You can drive a car beautifully when the sun is shining, when the birds are chirping, 
when there's no traffic and no taxis pulling in front of you. But when we put all of these things in your way, it becomes very difficult for you to actually work at the level that you're capable of. And so your marks don't reflect your true potential. And you are not doing as well as you should be doing. Your self-esteem is going down the toilet um, and all these other things that, that tend to happen. This is where teachers start complaining about spelling, writing, um, illegible writing, children not answering in full sentences, children not reading questions properly, children not listening, inverted commas, because they can hear you, but you're very right. With all this going on, they definitely cannot listen to what it is that you're telling them. Um, and these are the, the issues that we see as a result of these things. And so when we do this, all we end up doing is uh, when we're working at the end point, we are patching holes in our wall. We are trying to cover up the real issues. And if the real issues aren't sorted out, the problem is not going to go away. So let's just see what happens in classroom. There's the teacher. She's busy talking. Shame. She's a very happy teacher. I don't understand what's going on on that board. That would already throw me and put me into stress and I would be feeling I'm in a dangerous space. The minute I see letters in maths, that's when maths stopped making sense to me. But whatever the case is, let's see what happens. OK, so I'm sitting in the classroom. Now, all of a sudden, a reflex is triggered. I've got reflexes that make no sense at all. I have reflexes in my back. Um, and if I've got a, pres a, a spinal gallant that's present, if I lean on the back of my chair and that gets triggered, my body immediately wants to move forward or shift out of that position. And so I begin to wriggle. OK, this interruption has hijacked my system. And so now I'm not focusing on that beautiful math sum on the board and the teacher. No, my body is giving me this alert signal. Something's wrong. Something's affecting you. For some kids, it's not even the back of the chair. It's the label in their clothes. And so now they're going to get also in trouble because they're not sitting straight. They're making noises. This is some of the, the symptoms we see with the spinal gallant. And all while this is happening, they have lost what the teacher was saying. So their learning itself has been interrupted because their body got the signal that something's not right and I need to respond. And so what happens? We see that the information is getting to the brain delayed. The information is coming in all scrambled. This brain is shifting often into survival mode. So it moves into its brain organization. And we can teach you more about, more about that in our OBO course. And not only that, but we've got imbalances possibly in this brain because we're seeing this red flag that's still there. And this results in an inappropriate response. Me wriggling in the chair is going to be seen as inappropriate. Again, a symptom of the spinal gallant. Me humming or making noises is going to be seen as an inappropriate response. Very sad little case study to share with you. Um, I helped with an FDH at a school. And of course, this young girl was really, really battling in the classroom. And of course, the whole list was the, the, the normal. Can't concentrate, doesn't hand in work, zones out, doesn't finish work, leaves books at home. And so I was very privileged to actually do a profile with her. And what we found was that, yes, there was definitely this brain imbalance. In terms of our OBO work, she was using more of the right brain when she was stressed, which tends to forget the details, zone out when stressed. Um, can't express what they're thinking or feeling at that point and so that that's a great help in the class and forgets details so forgets books forgets to do things forgets what the teacher says this child was under immense stress when we got to the crux of the matter not only that she also had some of these reflexes out and of course one of these was the the spinal gallant and so she would often walk around making little noises and this was becoming quite a thing because the teachers would get irritated, not understanding that this is actually quite normal if you understand that it's the result of a spinal gallant and she needs to move in a specific way. Um, but of course, she was getting mocked for it by other kids. And so this inappropriate response due to this was causing her much, much uh, distress in her life. And so these and that's what we're going to get into just now. But you're going to see that often the symptoms and the behaviors that seem weird and inappropriate are really just showing you that these are primitive reflexes that need to be packed away. 
And if I understand that, I can see that this is just a person who is under immense stress and who needs help and movement. And if I know what to do, well, I can do that. I can be that difference in this person's life. Sadly, for this child, um, it wasn't really the case. She wasn't understood. Um, what we put across wasn't taken up as such. Um, and she did end up having to leave the school and find a different environment. Is it a sad ending? I wouldn't say so, because I think the environment where she is learning now is far more conducive to learning. She's in a space where there are smaller classes, where there's far more lenience when you're stressed, where there's an understanding that mistakes get made and it's rather about correcting them than punishing the, the, the mistake itself. And so she actually is thriving in the space that she finds herself now in. If primitive reflexes are still present to some extent and postural reflexes are not fully developed, then it can have an impact on voluntary movement in various aspects. So I choose to move, I choose to write, I choose to do these things. But if these automatic movements are needing to be overridden all the time, you can imagine how I first have to override these things I don't want to see happen before I can actually move in a way I want to. So let's take a look. So it can be challenging to maintain a proper posture while standing, sitting or moving around. So I hope you're starting to think about that poor kid who has a poor posture, who lies on the table, who can't sit up straight, who irritates you because he always seems tired or he's always fidgeting and moving. Okay, not able to balance, so our little clumsy kid is tripping over his own two feet. Okay, it will be challenging to sit still, just like me talking about that spinal gland before. The child will back with coordination and the development of motor skills. They're going to experience difficulty with eye movement and control, which is necessary for reading and writing. So yes, our ophthalmologists work a lot on these movements in the eyes. Um, some of these, again, as I'm saying, coming from these active reflexes. And of course, we're not going to cover them individually in today's session, but of course, some of these that spring to mind straight away is our TLR, our ATNR, our STNR, which all have symptoms linked to our movement. So they will struggle. You can understand why if I can't move my eyes and my body and I can't coordinate my body, well, then I'm going to struggle with hand and eye coordination. And this will impact reading and writing. How? You know, when you're reading, you first teach your kid to use their little finger under the words. And writing, in actual fact, is that whole reading and writing together as I move my hand and eye across the page. The child will struggle with spatial awareness issues. And so you're talking reversing letters, writing them up versus down or left versus right, um, map reading, all these type of things, because I don't know where I am in space. Have issues, sorry that jumps up, have issues with regards to organisation. They can't organise themselves. Okay, how do you sequence stuff if you're getting interrupted all the time? They will battle to regulate their emotions. And this is a very important one. Our fear paralysis reflex and our moral reflex are the first reflexes that come into play in utero. And they're all about feeling safe. And so just as I stop and pause there for a little bit, the fear paralysis is basically the baby plays possum. The baby can't do anything else, okay? And so it holds its breath, so breath is important for this one, and it stops moving, okay? It freezes until the perceived danger has gone. And so while this is happening, this baby feels like they're in danger of their life, okay? And we're going to get to this just now. The morrow is the fight or flight one, and so we get these children who are actually incredibly anxious, but we don't see their anxiety. We see them lashing out. We see them being defiant. We see them becoming aggressive while they are trying to defend themselves because they are feeling so um, unsafe at a very, very deep level, a level where they probably can't even communicate that fact to you. And so when you say, why are you angry? Why are you doing that? They battle to actually put that in words. OK, so with the fight or flight, we got that fight response, that aggression or we have the flight response, that avoidance, that withdrawal, that pulling away, that climbing under the table so I don't have to do this work, this becoming the clown in the class so that I can distract and get away from things. And so it's very important, as you can see, 
the body asking, am I safe or am I in danger? The very, very basis of survival. Um, if I'm safe, I can learn, I can, in, I can engage. If I'm in danger, I need to freeze or I need to fight this danger or I need to run away. And of course, you can understand how these getting triggered by things that make no sense are going to have a big response in the body. So they'll struggle with impulse control. Yes, if I'm defensive and, I, and I'm stressing and I'm overwhelmed, I tend to lash out without thinking. They battle to focus and concentrate. And again, you saw this again is these things are very important and contribute to our ADHD, our ADD, our autism. And I hope again that as you think about that page we went through, you can understand why these things are actually um, part of this little package for each of these little labels that we have. So we can look at what causes them. So pregnancy, okay, pregnancy, if you've had a stressful pregnancy, I had a client, it was very interesting. Um, when we checked the children's reflexes, there was a lot of primitive reflexes still there. And when I asked her about her pregnancy, she said, well, quite interesting, what's coming to mind is they were renovating. And there was a lot of loud noises while they were renovating. And so this baby was very active um, because of that. And so when you understand, like these reflexes are already there in utero, as early as nine weeks in utero, to try and protect this baby, you can understand that these could be being triggered while this baby is being developed. And so Dr. Kala Hannaford, who writes Smart Moves, explains how when the morrow is triggered constantly during pregnancy, this starts getting in the way of the vestibular system um, developing. And so, of course, this uh, the vestibular system has got a lot to do with taking in visual information and auditory information. And so we see learning issues often related to issues within the vestibular system. So again, why do we ask about pregnancy? Why do we ask about the mom's emotions? Well, the baby experiences mom's emotions as chemical reactions in the blood. And so if mom's anxious, if mom's unhappy, baby's anxious and baby's unhappy. Why? Why would God do something like this? Uh, Bruce Lipton explains it beautifully in, the work, in his work and he explains, well, this baby is preparing for a world it doesn't know. And so if it's a very scary world it's getting born into, well, it's got to be ready for that. But if this world is a nice, calm world that it's getting born into, it can relax. And it will then, of course, feel more loved and more able to, to um, engage. And so if you can just think back to your own pregnancy, um, consider that. What kind of emotions did you have during pregnancy? Because that was what your baby was feeling. If you were anxious about this new child that you didn't know, and I was like that with my first one, were you going to be able to do this? Well, that's how the baby felt. If you were able to relax and enjoy the pregnancy, that's what the baby felt. And so don't beat yourself up. We did the best that we could. What we do know with this work is that we can go back. And, and that's the beautiful thing with our rhythmic movement training. If you do that course, you learn how to go back to moves the baby would have experienced in utero. And it's such a, sp a, a precious space for mom and child where they can do these moves and just connect and bond. Perhaps they hadn't been given that opportunity then to do so. So this, this work is wonderful, as I say. So, so good for the soul. The type of birth is also important. Um, so I won't get into it. But of course, birth, the whole, these reflexes are also there to help the baby be, be born. They're there to... Um, emerge at a very specific time for very specific things that this baby has to go through. And of course, birth is a big one. And so a baby going through the birth canal, um, not having to be in labor for mommy being in labor too long, because of course, that's quite quite a thing, quite an ordeal for a baby, um, or for too quick. Uh, these are things that impact it. This baby wriggling through that birth canal, using the spinal gland, stretching out their back as they do so is so important coming through a space where they are, you know, in, exposed to mom's bacteria, to start cult cultivating bacteria in their own gut. These are all the benefits of natural birth. Of course, we can't all do it. And we're very thankful that there are ways in which we can um, intervene and make sure babies and moms, you know, arrive on the other side healthy. But yes, then we consider the C-section, 
the suction, the breech birth, um, and all these other things that can happen during this time. Anesthetics can affect us and affect the uh, cause these to reemerge. Nutrition and allergies, nutrition and intolerances. Toxic exposure, and that's toxins within the body, heavy metals within the body, parasites within the body, but it's also toxins in the environment, and we are bombarded with, um, you know, Wi-Fi signal and that on a constant basis. Um, injuries to the head and to the body, illnesses, uh, chronic ear infections, lack of movement is a big one, because this is where we can come in and absolutely make sure that we're we getting our children to move. Stress is a massive one, as we spoke about, you know, how does the body heal itself and how does the body look after and fight off stress? And of course, when the body is so overwhelmed by this perceived danger that it's on guard and it's always out looking for trouble, well, it's leaving very little time to healing and growing and developing. And of course, trauma being another one there. So you, of course, can stop and jot this down if you like, but let's take a look what happens before birth. So, well, it's about mom's lifestyle and health going into birth. You know, if she's smoking, if she's drinking, if she's taking drugs, that's going to create a toxic environment for this baby to be developing in. But even medications we have to be very careful of. And so if you are on chronic medication, obviously you really want to work closely with a doctor. But the goal is obviously to be as healthy and as free of any substances that are not natural to baby um, while you are pregnant. Prolonged exposure to levels of electromagnetic stress, and that's very difficult in the life in which we live. Mother not being active enough or requiring long periods of stress. Um, moms often are doing office jobs, and so you'll see in our rhythmic movement training again how much movement we are doing for the child. And this is the type of movement baby would be getting in as mom is cleaning house, doing dishes, um, walking around, doing things she should actually be really doing um, while the baby is lulled by that movement and get, you know, gets that input in. Um, many moms are at office jobs now just sitting for hours on end. And then, of course, when we have got complications, we're often told to, to be still. Insufficient dietary intake during pregnancy, um, we definitely also need to be looking at supplements, very important supplements. Um, you know, they say that the, the pregnancy is actually a parasitic, <laughs> it's, it's like you have a parasite. And of course, it's a parasite we love with our, all our heart for the rest of our life. But yes, this, this baby is using our nutrition and the vitamins we're taking in. So we've got to make sure we're taking in the right stuff. And of course, if mom like I said earlier, is going through that emotional distress. Baby is going through that emotional distress. Mom at least can reason her way through because she can see what's happening. But baby's got no understanding. Why am I feeling completely threatened right now? Um, there's no, there's no uh, sense. There's nothing to anchor that to for that baby. During birth, so here we go, premature birth. Very long or very slow delivery. Very fast, second part of a delivery. C-section birth, breech birth, low birth weight, small um, for gestational age, so that's when the baby's just small, forceps, vacuum delivery, epidural, fetal, fetal distress, umbilical cord complications, and of course oxygen, oxygen deprivation. After birth, the baby spends extended time, periods of time, in an upright position before gaining control over their body. So also just you know, we want them first to start with that neck control. Don't force their body into a position that they're not ready for yet. So swaddling a baby excessively tight, and there's certain beliefs that this should be done, you know, for extended periods of time. No, this baby does need time and space to move. Inadequate affectionate touch. So these babies who are taken off, um, and you know, you've got to just, just, again, we can move, we can help these children. But we don't know, you know, how much they're getting picked up at day mother when there's six babies there. Um, and again, please, I don't want to plant any seeds or any doubt in your mind if you've chosen somebody and you trust them. But make sure that when you get baby home, you're not on your cell phone. You're not sitting, um, you know, disconnected, but that you're picking up your child, that you're talking to them, that you're playing with them, and that you're touching them, that you're rubbing their feet, rubbing their hands, rubbing their back. Screen use of babies. <laughs> Used to babysit this. I even saw a, an infant using her feet to scroll the other day. I almost freaked. 
there's no there's no app that substitutes a lap okay so yes they can tell you there's oh it's academic it does this it does that i'm sorry your child learns through three dimensional real time play first if you are building a block or a puzzle on a screen rather go get a puzzle and build your puzzle with your kids rather go get building blocks and build with your kid don't give them an app um, that's got it's so far removed from how they learn okay supporting baby's neck with equipment too much um, yeah you, you might know what they sell out there bottle feeding insufficient time spent on their tummy so again when they're ready then we start putting them on their tummy they're not going to like it it's hard work they're doing exercise do you like doing a hundred sit-ups no but you start off small you put them on their tummy for a few minutes a day and tomorrow you put them on for a little bit longer and the next day you put them on for a little bit longer and you're down there encouraging them and you've got toys or something that they can look at so that there's an incentive to do what they need to do not enough time spent carrying and rocking and holding the baby no we put them in a carrier cot um, of course no nothing again substitutes that touch from mom and of course as we know tension within the relationships between parents so well we're not going to go into reflexes specifically the the individual ones in this webinar i'm going to give you some of their names and then you can at a later stage when you're ready perhaps look into the ones that interest you so let's look at the order that we see them more or less coming through and the reasons why we're having them what they're there for so the first one is the fear paralysis reflex i've spoken about this one please uh, i see i was wrong well, this one comes in as, as early as five weeks in utero and this is the one that has everything to do with withdrawal with anxiety and with sleep and of course this is the one where the baby plays possum it should merge or become the moro reflex and so the moro reflex we've got this fight or flight response so anxiety and aggression or this withdrawal and this emerges at about uh, nine to twelve weeks in um in the utero uh, this should become the adult startle so that's the one where you get a fright and you jump you should jump a little bit when we've got this moral reflex still active we have a huge response and arms fling out um, and i smiled the other day because i was actually at the shop and i walked past quite an older elderly gentleman and i didn't think i had given him such a fright i thought he saw me coming but he had a bigger than usual response which could again point to the fact that this morrow is still there. And so these people, yes, as I spoke about before, these are the two very, very much so that have to do with danger. I mean, danger, what am I going to do? Am I going to freeze? Am I going to fight? Or am I going to run away? And so we have big responses when these are still around. The Babkins is for feeding and bonding, and this is a hand reflex. Um, this is the one where you see the little fingers sometimes moving on a little blanket or something we see this in nine weeks in utero the palmer also a hand reflex so therefore hand movement and for speech the hand the feet and the mouth are all on the same circuit in our work so we understand with regards to our the brain and so when we're working on speech we are always working on the hand and the feet and the mouth and so this palmer reflex emerges from about 11 to 18 weeks in utero the planter so the plant is there for walking for emotional grounding and speech as i explained and this emerges at about 11 and a half weeks in utero the tlr i spoke about earlier on so this its, it's full name is tonic labyrinthine reflex and you've got two parts you've got a forwards and a backwards these are our floppy kids our kids with their poor posture or kids with a very tight posture depending on if it's the forwards or backwards um, part of this reflex that we're seeing more of and this will emerge 12 weeks in utero asymmetrical tonic neck reflex so we call that the atnr for feeding for breastfeeding vestibular stimulation proprioception auditory and visual processing this emerges around 18 to 20 weeks as you look at those words again please be reminded of that tower and where we found all of these things in that tower to understand as we're looking at these things in the higher tiers again the vestibular the auditory the visual 
that the problem itself might be this specific reflex, which is at the foundation of our tower. The spinal gallant, I spoke about him before. I like to call him our ADHD reflex. Um, as I said earlier on, remember many of these labels that we give these children are actually made up a lot of these primitive reflexes that are affecting the way the brain is working and all of the things going on. We do not diagnose in our work. Um, I'm not about diagnosing. I am not interested in the label. However, when I see clients, I am interested in seeing if the spinal gallant, for, for instance, is still present. The spinal Perez and Volmer. So look at this. These develop into the STNR, the Landau, the TLR, the spinal gallant, and writing reflexes. And so you can start to understand how certain of these, if they don't get packed away, are going to hold back or stop others from emerging or getting packed away themselves. And so this one here emerges at about 20 to 38 weeks in utero. We're not even born yet. Okay, and so many people think that children who aren't born yet aren't, you know, um, what you call it, don't have any rights, and yet all this beautiful stuff is happening in this beautiful miracle even before it's born. So root suck, tongue thrust, swallow and gag reflex for feeding and bonding. Remember, breastfeeding is not just about the food, it's about being close to mom. And that again emerges about 28 weeks in utero. The tendon guard is a lifelong reflex. It needs to be there throughout our life. But when you know what it looks like, you can understand we really don't want it to be triggered, you know, over, over more than it should be. And if you know what it looks like, you will see how it fits into many of the labels that we went through earlier on. Babinski reflex for walking and for upright posture. This emerges around birth. The Landau. We like to think of him as the happy reflex because it connects mind and body. We see this now, so we're now finally born at about two to three months. Writing reflexes emerge from two to four months. And symmetrical tonic neck reflex for copying off the board reflex, I like to call him. We see him at about four to six months. So perhaps it's time to just stand up, stretch a bit have a loo break, get a coffee. The beauty about a pre-recorded webinar is that you can do that whenever. But we are heading into quite an important part of our webinar. And if we had the time and space, I'd have you cross-crawling now to activate the brain so that we can make sure that you can take in this information. And so let's, let me give you a bit of a break as I just chat around perhaps where you might be finding yourself at while you might be stretching or just moving in your chair and making sure that you are comfortable. So perhaps at this point you're saying, well, I don't necessarily want to be an educational kinesiologist and movement facilitator like Kerry. Um, this is really inspiring, but I don't feel called to, you know, give up my day job yet or just yet. And so, well, perhaps you are that person. And if that's the case, then of course, if you get in touch with me, I can take you through our learning track and I can share with you what courses you, you would have to do in what order. If you are, like I'm guessing most of us are on this webinar, we are interested because we're parents, we're interested because we're teachers, we're interested in understanding these reflexes and we want to know how these look in our child. Um, and so here you're in the right space. Uh, but after this, what happens once you filled in that evaluation form and you found out that actually it looks like there might be retained primitive reflexes? Well, that's when you can get in touch with a movement facilitator who's done their RMTI training uh, or a kinesiologist who's also done their training. And the beauty of the RMTI work is it's developed in such a way that it could be given to the parent as a home program while being overseen by the facilitator. And so this is something that has to be done in routine, in repetition, and because the body absolutely loves this consistency. And so again, I love this space for teachers because for me, who sees the children the most in a day? Parents, we hope, but not always with the life we lead. Definitely teachers. And especially if you're sitting in your ECD and your foundation phase and you've got a little bit more time with these kids, you are seeing them every single day and you can bring this in. Setting it in your routine, part of your daily routine, 
you're going to have a huge impact on these children because as I say this is what makes this program successful it's the person who could take it and use these specific moves on this child on a regular basis and so yes um, if you're interested in courses that's where we could train you up as a teacher or you up as a parent to do the work yourself otherwise getting back to the other one where you might be wanting the movement facilitator to oversee it that's perfect then you would just be in contact and you'd be following up and talking continually to the person who's overseeing and of course watching those moves so yes it does take a bit of maybe videoing and sending to and fro but it can be done and of course it is it is so marvelous i've had such wonderful feedback from the children who are doing these programs and i'm overseeing them i'm hearing how much more confident they are i'm hearing of the emotional changes that come out come about often first and so I absolutely love this work. But without further ado, let's get into it. So the physical signs of a retained primitive reflex. So number one, sensitivities. We'll get into this, but we all know these children who are very sensitive. They are sensitive to everything, to light, to sound, to the food they eat, to the clothes they wear, to the things they touch. For our boys, we get this prolonged breaking of the voice. So any time I hear sensory processing issues, so you wondered why I took you through that sensory overload in the beginning sitting in the car, okay? And that is because most of the fact that we can't process these sensory, the sensory information coming in in the right time and integrated beautifully is because these reflexes are popping up and interfering with that information coming into the brain and then leaving the brain for the appropriate response as well. So we've, we've spoken a little bit about this, all types of sleep disorders, balance and coordination issues. So again, I had a kid and I kept saying, is this child just clumsy? And I used to start wondering, when is it a just thing and they're going to grow out of it? And through all these courses, I've come to appreciate there's no kid that is just clumsy. If they're clumsy, there's a reason and it's usually a reflex that's there. Motion sickness. Poor pupillary reaction to light. I hope I've said that right. I just rambled it on there. Um, it's a bit hard to always see that with the kids. Obviously, if it's your own and you've got the time and you can get in their face, that is something that you can look at. Tense muscles. Difficulty chewing food. So these children, you, know, you always have to cut their food up into very small pieces or they're eating slop. So yogurts and mash because they just, they're not, being, you know, they're not chewing nicely. Picky eaters and eating disorders. A tongue being too far forward in the mouth. And this is something we went off to the doctor because we were very worried about with our son. Um, and I didn't know in those days that this was actually the symptom of a reflex. Complaints about sore back and sore feet. Scoliosis. One leg being longer than the other. Bladder weakness wet in the bed after the age of five and I feel very sorry for these kids so this is one that comes up often on the groups that I look at on Facebook where I see moms asking questions um, and I feel so sorry for the kid because the kid ends up getting shouted at so not only might this child be battling with sleep but they finally fall asleep and they've emptied their bladder at night but it fills during the evening the problem with the spinal gallant and we mentioned him before is if he is triggered it can actually end up being the releasing of the bowel. And so this child ends up wetting their bed by no fault of their own. It's not done on purpose. It is this involuntary uh, reflex that is causing problem, problems. And sadly, I heard of a colleague's story where she said she had worked with a client and this lady was long, um, I think she was maybe in her 70s. And she had never been in a nice, good relationship because she had this problem. And of course, she was very embarrassed about this problem, which caused, you know, self-esteem issues. But of course, every time she had a partner, then this would end up happening and they couldn't understand it. And so they came to understand it was a spinal gallant that hadn't been integrated. And so all this lady's poor relationship issues for years and years and years had been due to a silly little reflex. Ingrown toenails, excessive drooling, frequent ankle sprains, 
a tendency to be cross-eyed. We spoke about our ophthalmologist and, of course, how he looks at eyes and that. Um, and, of course, yes, reflexes pull our eyes in or out, or whatever the case is. Making noises, I spoke about before, humming and singing and talking to yourself. Hand-eye coordination issues, low muscle tone, poor posture, your inner temperature gauge not working. So we've got those kids who it's the middle of summer and they're in those jerseys and they're sweating, but they haven't thought to take their jersey off. They can't gauge that they're actually feeling hot. Awkward walk, run and skip. Poor digestion, so here we've got our IBS symptoms. High arching palate, and this was very interesting. This is actually one of the, um, oh, the symptoms for ADHD in one of the pamphlets that I came across. Needs orthodontal work, so skew teeth, restless legs, and more. Now, this is one of my favorite parts um, of reflexes because obviously the physical and academic makes sense for a lot of people. But many people don't realize the behaviors that we see because these are triggered. So I hope also, again, as we head to this part, it's not going to be news to you to understand when these are triggered, I could be feeling very unsafe. OK. And so I'm going to have a reaction according to that on an emotional level. So let's see some of the emotional stuff that we see with these. So we actually find that we've got children who are emotionally immature. Very interesting, again, as we look at our ADHD um, checklists. And of course, one of them will say that children are two to three years behind their peers in terms of their emotional development. OK, withdrawn or excessive shyness. Um, and I, I really, really smile, but feel very frustrated because I've obviously come across people where um, I've obviously done um, a profile with a child in terms of the reflexes that are out. And then they will go and do the academic side. And then I say, but this is pointing to more. And then they'll tell me, oh, the child's just shy. The child's just withdrawn. So no, again, with all these things, please, if you're seeing, and we don't want, and I haven't put that out there, we don't want full marks as I'm going through this list. Can you imagine the poor child who was getting full marks for all the things that I'm busy putting up? No, we do not want, it's not a test, it's not a competition. You do not want to be the winner and have all of these showing. Um, if you're sitting here and you're seeing one or two popping up, you've got to start saying, this could possibly be a reflex causing this. Okay, and so when somebody says, oh, they're just clumsy, they just shy. Um, there's no, there's no such thing. Take a look at why. Okay, anxiety insecurities makes a lot of sense. Tendency to lash out the fight response. Poor adaptability and tendency, tendency to be inflexible. So some of these kids, you actually see them getting stuck. Um, on a, so they, they come across as a bit of having like an obsess, obsession or being compulsive. Okay. Depression and despondency. Unexplained fears. Spoke about this earlier on. If I'm feeling anxious because I'm feeling anxious because a reflex is triggered, I don't know why I feel the way I do. And so when somebody keeps saying to me, but why are you scared? But why are you scared? I start thinking there has to be a reason for me to feel this way. And this is where we get these crazy phobias as well, because then I start connecting it to things in the environment that's got nothing to do with the feeling that I'm having. Um, but of course, in my mind, trying to make sense of this feeling, I've arrived at this strange conclusion. So it's like the flapping of the bird's wing, for instance. Okay, tendency to be a loner, may be abrupt or rude. So again, we just shout and we fight with the behavior, but we don't ask why we're seeing this often. Hyperactivity, manipulative or, sorry, manipulation or dominant behavior. Difficulty connecting with others. We can see again how this relates to some of the labels. Defiant behavior, impulsive behavior, poor self-esteem, unrealistic view of self may battle to let things go. These are the kids who just can't move on. We can see they're getting stuck on something again there. Tend tendency to be secretive, okay? Like I've said, obsessive compulsive symptoms. 
needs constant reassurance. This is a child always coming up asking, is this okay? Did I do it fine? Not good listeners. So again, it doesn't mean they can't hear you, but they can't take in what, what's being said. Argumentative. Very interesting, isn't it? Talks too much and interrupts. Lacks emotional grounding. Perfectionistic behavior. Difficulty with self-control. Trouble getting in touch with their own feelings. Difficulty perceiving someone else's viewpoint. A very big one again with our children with ASD. And so again, there's a lot more that you could get into. And if you do choose to do these courses, you will start learning which ones these each relate to as well. Let's face it, you're all looking at the roof. <laughs> so let's look at the roof. Let's see in terms of academics, what are these things going to mean for our children in the classroom? Um, so let's take a look here. Poor concentration. Difficulty completing a task. Difficulty shutting up background noise. So this was very interesting um, with the next one. The next one is auditory processing issues. So I often, when my kid was younger, my son, I'd open up his book and they'd say, you didn't listen, you didn't follow instructions. And I eventually just decided, you know what, I can't explain this to somebody who doesn't want to listen, <laughs> ironically. Um, yeah, it was about grade four level. We did a bit of neurofeedback, which I'll talk about just now. And um, through this whole process, for the first time, um, we were able to talk about the noise in the class. And my little one said to me, mommy, everything's coming in at the same loudness. OK, and it was the first time I realized this poor child was having um, to use such a lot of mental capacity to just try to drown out the clicking of the pen, the person walking in the corridor, um, the children talking outside on the playground. Um, the birds, because the school ha always has birds in the roof, <laughs> the birds flapping um, at the roof, uh, just to be able to focus in on what the teacher's saying. Of course, with him being uh, on the autistic spectrum, there's a lot of other language things that come to play. But just looking at this auditory processing, it was a big thing. And this is why he was so tired at the end of the day, having to override and, and filter, actively filter out this information that he needed during classroom time. Other problems, speech and articulation issues. So pronunciation, the actual speaking, you're going to see just now stuttering as well. Children who chew on pencils and everything, clothes and nails and whatever else. Okay, children who have a problem developing their fine motor skills. Poor dexterity, poor pencil grip. Stuttering, as I just said, and stammering is rooted in reflexes, difficulty grasping concepts, difficulty with mathematical with mathematics concepts, spelling issues. The A T N R is very much um, got to do with reversals of letters in and jumping of eyes while reading. So dyslexia, letter and number reversals, difficulty constructing stories with flow, lying on the desk when working skipping words when reading, slow at copying off the board, that's our STNR, spatial difficulties, poor sequencing, so putting things in the wrong order, poor sense of time, trouble staying on task, difficulty perceiving sounds, poor handwriting, repeats lines when reading or writing, Fidgets, can't sit still. So just pausing there. As I'm going through this, I'm hoping you are thinking about some of the game, those labels we went through. And if I'm a teacher who can work with this in the children every day in the classroom and I can start packing some of these away, well, then we can see what's still left after that and what still needs to be worked on and how we can get that assistance. But of course, having the, the moves and the power to work on these things and pack these away is definitely going to help us understand what this child needs help with. So reading with no feeling, attention problems. And again, these are coming up from different ones. So you can see some of them seem to repeat. It's just because, again, it's more than one reflex that also affects it. Hyperactivity, impulse control problems, poor short-term and long-term memory, vision issues, and more. So just a little side note here um, about the pandemic and our work and the fact that many of us educational kinesiologists predicted 
that we were going to have huge amounts of children with learning difficulties going forward. And so last year when they spoke about the grade fours being illiterate, um, it was no surprise, sadly, to us. Um, unfortunately, again, you know, I trust that these type of webinars will get the, the message across. It's not about doing more reading, writing and maths. It's about going back to the basics. These children were robbed of movement to integrate reflexes and to help the brain development at a pivotal age and a, and a very important time in the, the academic, academic life. So let me start by showing you what we would do. Okay, so say you're a client, you come to me and we see you've got this fear paralysis reflex. So number one, I would get you to consider your situation that you're in. And the situation that you probably in when we see this jump out is a scary one, one where you feel that you are in danger. And so I would want to create a sense of calm and ease. We would think about how can we bring that calm into this situation in this space. We do this through a process called the balance. While we're doing this, we're encouraging the client to breathe because if I can get oxygen, which feeds all my cells in my body, okay, we know that um, I can go three minutes without air, three days without water and three weeks without food. That was the, the rule of thumb we were taught as kids, hey? So breath is the most important. If I can't breathe, my body panics, okay? If I'm not getting oxygen, my body starts panicking. So I teach the client to breathe so that we can tell this body that we are safe. And then I get the client to move. Why? Because in the fear paralysis, what is the action? I'm holding my breath because breathing is moving. And then someone could see my abdomen rising and falling as I'm breathing. So I have to hold my breath and I have to be dead still. And so this action tells my body I'm in danger. So every time I do this action, um, I'm giving my body the signal that I'm in danger. I'm holding my breath. I'm not moving I'm in a dangerous situation, whether I've felt that feeling or not. Very interesting how the body works. And so I would do the opposite. Move, breathe, release that stress from the body and allow the body to know it's safe. Okay, what were we made to do? Well, we were bombarded by negativity, absolutely bombarded. Okay, we were made to, to feel like our lives were in danger. Not only were we in a dangerous space, we could potentially die at any given moment. Okay, we then were made to wear masks, which limited this oxygen intake. And we were told to stay at home, not moving, not playing. And there's a whole long study where certain people didn't even go out into the sunlight in certain countries. Thank goodness, South Africa, we could. And we did. But I've written this so that you can just see, hopefully, as you pull your eye across from left to right, how the exact opposite was done and why we re-educated this peer, fear paralysis reflex. So now we've, re, we've helped um, reflexes re-emerge as such. On top of that, and we won't get into it in this um, webinar, but children are also meant to learn at a younger age in a very different way to the way in which we learn at an older age where the left brain is coming online more and more. And so children who were in grade one, who were then in grade four last year, they were in grade one during the pandemic. Oh, sorry, I just didn't say that. Okay, so they were in grade one during the pandemic. And they learn in a more of an interaction uh, type way that I can engage, that I'm hands on with my learning material, that I'm experiencing the environment in terms of the relationship I have with my friends and my teacher. And my teacher's proud of me. And they were robbed of that type of learning. And so there is no wonder, they, <laughs> you know, why these children haven't had the foundations put in place. And so we absolutely need to help that year, that grade, and of course, anyone else that was affected to that extent. So with these, these are two checklists. Um, uh, they're not the checklists, but they're checklists I've come across where people are looking at children who might have symptoms on the left for ADHD, on the right for autism spectrum disorder. And so what I thought I'd do for you is I thought I would highlight anything where a reflex could be interfering or contributing to this. And so what you can see is I've been able to highlight quite a lot. OK, <laughs> and this for me is very empowering. OK, 
So what this means is as I bring in movement, if I know the movements to bring in, as I send children off to do a movement program that integrates these, I can definitely start helping all these areas that have been highlighted on these pieces of paper. And so, yes, again, I say it, I'm not interested in diagnosing and the labels. That's not my job. That's definitely somebody else's job. But as a teacher, as an educational kinesiologist, I am interested in making people's lives better by using movement so that they can develop their body and their brain in a way that they can cope better with stress. So just as promised, I wanted to share a bit of neurofeedback with you. Um, and how does it have its place in this work that I'm talking about? So we've spoken a lot about the reflexes. These tend to happen within the body and we pack them away through movement so that the information coming into the brain for processing can come in smoothly without interruption. But what happens if there's an imbalance in the brain itself? And this is the awesome thing about neurofeedback. So neurofeedback is a system where I have got electrodes that I put onto the head using a paste. Um, you can use a cap and I put them on at certain parts of, of the head and this device can read the brain activity through the skull at, at each of these points. So it doesn't hurt, it's non-invasive, nothing goes into the system. We're just looking at the electricity, how much electricity the brain is using at the different spots. And when we know what the different spots are for, we know what this means and how it might be presenting in the child. Is this child, you know, does this child have way too much anxiety? And so this is some of the things that we can see. We can see anxiety. We can see low SMR. So that's a low mind and body connection. That's the sensory motor rhythm SMR that we're looking at there. We can see if this child is going to battle with daydreaming, always be daydreaming. Um, we're going to see if there's things getting in the way of their ability to focus. If they have a busy brain that won't switch off if they are going to battle with recalling words, if they're going to have further language issues, not because of the reflexes, but because of the way in which the, the brain is processing the information. Do they have depression markers? So again, it's not per depression per se, but are they able to deal well with things when it's not in their control? Do Again, we don't look for ADHD, but do they have patterns that we've seen in people with ADHD called ADHD markers? Okay. Do, are they experiencing sadness? Do they have poor sleep? Do they have poor memory? Do they have things that they haven't dealt with? They've just packed this away. Um, does the brain communicate properly with itself? Is there too fast thinking? Or is their voices really, really loud in their own head that they can't hear anything else? And of course, there's so much more. But as we start bringing these two together, we can again work on these at both levels. So we can pack away the reflexes and we can correct the brain activity through feedback. How that happens is once um, you've had an assessment as such and we've mapped out the different parts of the brain and the activity at those different sites, um, protocols or program will be put together. You will come in for brain training and during those sessions you will get an electrode put back on your head on the specific spot that they're going to be working on and then every time the brain does the right thing, the one that I really enjoy is that it gets a reward sound. And so the brain likes that, it wants to do that again. And every time it does something that we don't want it to do, it gets a sound that's an inhibiting sound. You listening to it, you won't know what you're listening to and it's designed to do that. You're not meant to know, but the brain knows. And so you can just go sit back, relax, listen to some interesting music, your brain is playing you, all the while your brain is getting the right feedback so that it knows what it should be doing, what activity it should have at each of those sites. And in so doing, it builds itself up. I've had quite a few um, clients that I've sent for neurofeedback um, and they've had huge improvements. However, they need to continue working on the movement because things like dyslexia, we see some of the, the issues, especially when we are profiling them, if somebody comes with such a label, we might see that there is activity in the brain that needs to be corrected, but there's also often, as we've spoken, uh, spoken about, the ATNR reflex that's interfering with the information coming into the brain. And so the brain, you know, it's like what they've taught us about computers, rubbish in, rubbish out. And so if you've got rubbish coming in because of your reflexes, 
well then how do you expect your brain to, to process that properly? And so these go hand in hand together as we begin to pack away the reflexes and correct, you know, we've got this beautiful ability here through neurofeedback to correct the activity at the brain. So where to next? I hope I've given you some ideas throughout this, but perhaps you want to book a profiling session and brain mapping. So during the profiling session, we will help you see which reflexes are coming out. And as part of the first session, you will actually get the first stage of that movement program to begin with. Um, you might also want to check out our website and Facebook page. I put up lives um, quite regularly on different topics coming up. Obviously, the reflex one is a big one. You know now why, <laughs> because it just involves so much of what we see in our life and in our kids. Um, you might want to ask for a movement program. We also do movement sessions at schools. Or you might want to find out about courses and workshops. And so again, I've got the course page you can head over to. And also you can look into rhythmic movement training. Just keep a lookout for our next free webinar as well. Um, we'll see what that's going to be about. I've already got some ideas. And of course, these are just ways to get information out there so that you can start making better decisions for yourself. It's been an absolute pleasure sharing this with you. I absolutely love the information and I'm very passionate about getting it out there. And if you want to get in contact with me, here's my details. Please feel free to send me an email, drop me a WhatsApp, and of course, let's see how we can support you.